Continuing with our discussion of the background necessary for AP Physics C mechanics, we're going to be looking now into coordinate systems, more specifically the two-dimensional coordinate systems of polar and Cartesian coordinates. Now the first system we're going to be looking at are polar coordinate systems, which uh, can be used to specify both coordinates and vectors using a length and an angle from some origin. And these are usually represented by r for radial distance and theta for the angle. So for example, if we have some sort of vector, let's call it v, with length r, so its magnitude v equals r, we normally set the origin for theta at the beginning of the x-axis. So this would be theta. And you can see that this will uh, specify an individual point in space as well as a vector pointing to that space. Now Cartesian coordinates are a bit different. They too require two coordinates, but in this case they use an x and y coordinate. And these should be, this should be the coordinate system you're more familiar with, uh, unless you've taken extensive pre-calc or whatnot. So if you have that same vector going to a point, you specify it instead of with the length and the angle, with this length here, its x coordinate, and this length here, its y coordinate. And you can uh, actually transition from one coordinate system to the other. For example, uh, basically to get the length r over here, use the Pythagorean theorem. So r squared equals x squared plus y squared, because this just forms a right triangle on which r is the hypotenuse and x and y are the two smaller sides. Likewise, you can use trig with this angle theta in here to relate uh, x and y to r and theta together. So x would be r cosine theta, because cosine theta equals x over r, because it's ad adjacent over hypotenuse. And likewise, y would equal r sine theta, because the y is on the opposite side, and sine is opposite side over hypotenuse. And lastly, if you're trying to relate uh, just theta to x and y, like this equation relates just r to x and y, you can do tangent of theta equals y over x, or theta equals the inverse tangent of y over x. And this is useful for getting uh, really precise measurements of angles. Now these, this coverage of coordinate systems should cover up uh, any misconceptions you may have developed in the last video due to, you know, use of angles as a coordinate system or use of components, uh, x and y, etc. But now we're going to be moving on to unit analysis. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing unit analysis. And so what you should know is that in physics, most numbers will have an associated unit because you're usually uh, measuring or calculating some sort of actual physical quantity. So for example, if you have some sort of rod of length L, uh, and you determine that L equals 4, you have to specify what units that is, because this could be 4 inches, it could be 4 miles, it could be 4 kilometers, etc. And so we're going to have to standardize a uh, system of units that we'll be using, because uh, otherwise it would make things really complicated. So for the purposes of this book and most scientific endeavor, we're going to be using the SI standard of units, the international metric system, basically, which have two types of units. They have the base units, and they have what are known as derived units. Now the base units are what comprise uh, basically what make up all the other units. So these are basic fundamental properties that you can measure. So meters, seconds, kilograms, and coulombs. And all of these, with the exception of the kilogram, are based off of some fundamental property of the universe that you can measure. So the meter is based on how far light travels in a certain amount of time. The second is based on oscillations of an electron, 
and coulombs are based on the fundamental charge of an electron or proton. Kilograms are the only exception. They have a physical kilogram in France that they actually have to uh, measure other things against, and it's kept under tight lock and key by the people who run the SI system of measurement. Now, from these four fundamental units, you can derive other units. For example, the SI unit for uh, velocity or speed is meters per second, so it's comprised of meters and seconds. For force, it's what is known as the Newton, which is one kilogram meter per second squared. And there's all kinds of different derived units for uh, pressure, you know, for uh, energy, etc. So all the other units are derived from these four base units. And all measured quantities will have some sort of unit, either base or derived. All right, now moving on to manipulating units. So for most of this course, we're going to be dealing with calculations uh, that use real uh, measurements and properties of units. So for example, addition and subtraction. If you wanted to you know, find how far a cannon shot or whatever, you could measure the distance to a tree halfway down range. So let's say this is 40 meters. And then from the tree, it went another 40 meters. And you can add these together to get 40 meters plus 40 meters yields 80 meters. So to add and subtract, you have to have numbers with the same units, and the result you get will be a number with similar units. And this is not just for arithmetic, this is in all conceptual equations and whatnot. Now for multiplication and division, basically you have to understand that units act as variables. So for example, if you wanted to measure a speed by, uh, you know, how long something travels, in this case 10 meters, in some time, let's say one second, uh, on a poorly drawn stopwatch, uh, what you'll find is that you can basically do that. You find the ratio of how long, 10 meters, every one second, and you get that it traveled 10 meters per second. In other words, units don't... Uh, just disappear through multiplication and division. They remain as sort of ratio of variables. So if you had 10a over 1b, you would get 10a over b. And likewise, you have 10 meters over one second, you get 10 meters per, per second. Now, uh, when you get into more complex functions, such as exponential functions, where you have e to uh, some expression up here, what you have to realize is that the argument to that expression, in this case the x, must be unitless. So if you have an input such as 10 meters, uh, e to the 10 meters doesn't mean anything. So what you have to do is add in some sort of constant that has the inverse uh, units. In this case, uh, this constant would have 1 over meters or meters to the negative 1. And the same thing goes for trigonometric functions. So you can't take the sine of 30 seconds. What you have to do is you have to have some constant you're multiplying by, and that constant will then have the units seconds to the negative one. In other words, both trigonometric and exponential functions have to have a unitless argument going in, and that way they will yield a unitless outcome. Lastly, uh, as far as substitution goes, you can substitute uh, one thing for another in some equation. Let's say you have AB equals CD. Uh, if A, if you have that AB in some later uh, expression, say K equals AB, if AB and CD have the same units, which they must necessarily from this, you can then substitute them in. So basically you can substitute quantities and if you wanted to do meters per second instead of this ratio of 10 meters to one second uh, as long as they have the same units involved in that substitution. Lastly, you can use unit analysis to check your answers on the test or in any sort of AP physics or any physics really environment. So for example, you have to check that uh, dimensionally, that is, you know, with time or length, etc., 
the units are the same on both sides. So in this case, you have one time over here, therefore you have to have one time over here, otherwise this expression will be incorrect. So you do that basically by uh, figuring out the individual units of each term and then sort of canceling them out until you have equal terms on either side. So in this case you have the root of an acceleration which is a length over a time squared times a length all over because these add, they must have the same units. You can check that this is an acceleration squared because it's an acceleration times an acceleration. And this is also an acceleration squared. So you have length squared over time to the fourth. And this is all under the, the radicand, by the way. Um, basically, what you can then do is cancel out terms until you have the correct units. So one length will cancel out with that length, then the next will cancel out with there, and then this t squared goes away, and this on the bottom becomes a t squared. This is now root 1 over t squared, or uh, time. Or this is 1 over t to the negative 2, rather. Or one single time unit. So you have a time unit over here, you have a time unit over here. You can tell that dimensionally this is correct, and your answer is uh, at least in the right form. It may not guarantee that it's correct, but it's easy to find if you're wrong using this dimensional analysis.